Hi everyone, this is Afsar from Gameberry Labs. Uh, I am the co-founder of Gameberry. Are you listening to this podcast while doing your daily commute on a metro or a bus? Look around you for a minute. I'm sure you will find quite a few people playing games on their smartphones. In many ways, you can say that the gaming industry was responsible for many of the tech revolutions we see today. In fact, one of the first jobs held by young Steve Jobs was at Atari, the gaming company. Most people discovered a love for computers through gaming, and it was gaming companies that started the original trend of charging people for software. One of the winners in the mobile casual gaming sector is a company called Gameberry Labs. Gameberry Labs is a bootstrapped startup which has built up an enviable global business from India. In this episode of the Founder Thesis podcast, your host Akshay Dutt talks to Afsar Ahmed about the business of gaming and how they built up a massive gaming company without raising any external capital. To hear more such industry deep dives, subscribe to the Founder Thesis podcast on any audio streaming app. So, what got you interested in gaming? I have played games a lot, especially uh, the TV video games that were there long back, right? I would not consider myself as a gamer gamer uh, because I've seen true gamers before uh, joining college. Uh, I had this tendency of going back to building and creating things is what I remember, which was adding just more meaning to life, uh, more or less. and i enjoyed that process and i think pretty much that is the uh, reason why i went into gaming eventually and have stick to gaming and building games uh-huh. so uh, you are an iit kharagpur engineer after which you worked at capillary uh, all of which is like fairly on the other side you know from designing to like that creative designing to like more analytics i mean were you feeling that itch to do something more creative and hence you quit capillary to start something or you know tell me what happened around that time one of the characteristic that i have is basically when i look at people who are doing something different and uh, interesting i start to observe them and try to imitate more or less so that's how uh, i started learning about how to build websites so i started learning programming uh, tried building few websites couple of facebook pages some concepts here and there for the last 3 years of kadakpur uh, which helped me get into capillary eventually because they felt ki i might add value to capillary and i joined capillary as a sd by the end of my tenure at capillary i felt ki i wanted to do more things but uh, probably the the profile would not allow me to do that so me with my friend jani uh, his face founded local Uh, and Govind was back then, who was the current co-founder. He was back there in college, so he was he passed out in 2014. I uh, passed out in 2013. So, so we decided to move out, uh, quit our jobs. We were pretty much clueless back then, but we had an idea of creating a social blogging platform. Uh, so, so we got together. We said, "Okay, let us build something uh, in this." We moved to Hyderabad for uh, for for a um, there was a. investor who was interested in us so we moved to hyderabad for him uh, but quickly realized that that was not going to work out for us so we spent some time in hyderabad uh, but again this social blog blogging platform was pretty much away from what we were uh, we thought could be a good product market fit uh, so quickly realized it uh, but we were out of jobs so uh, th- then the idea was uh, okay let's move on to something which will get funding which is ironic uh, because you have never is funds for gameberry <laughs> absolutely plus interestingly if you look at it, it's not the right approach to uh, entrepreneurship altogether and as such right so so that's what we did we we looked out and thought okay, okay what is working in us what would be interesting in india and we stumbled upon blue apron uh, and and we were fascinated by the idea that okay if people would like to cook at home let them let's give them exact ingredients in the exact quantity and they would love it so we started hasteespoon.com uh, in april of 2014 so 
did a run for three months in Hyderabad, then realized that Hyderabad is not the right place for getting funding. So we moved to Bangalore, back to Bangalore, uh, spent again three to four months over here. Um, we were very close to a, to a funding round, but then uh, luckily they saw what was wrong with us back then. And I feel uh, blessed because of that. Ki, okay, that thing happened with me and I eventually moved out. Uh, we both moved out, me, Jani and, and Govind also. That, okay, we will not do this. We will do go back and reevaluate what we want to do in life and then probably do something in future. So what what, what was wrong with Half Teaspoon? Uh, yeah, that idea, I don't think uh, it was ready for the market. First, second thing that I learned was uh, it was operation heavy and operation heavy, on ground operation heavy. And it was not something which was uh, catering to my appetite of creativity and uh, making things. Uh, because we, you were essentially be either building a basic app or a basic website and your real business was on the delivery side and logistics side, right? Yeah, yeah. essentially it's a hyper-logistics company. Yeah. Right, absolutely. And But when I, we, we all quit half teaspoon, what happened is uh, I was pretty much on square zero. Okay, what do I do now from here onwards? So then then gaming was something that uh, that was booming back then. Uh, booming as in there were a lot of new uh, games coming out in the app store play store and people were getting addicted to it people were playing it so and social gaming was like really taking off at that time right right absolutely so that that's why again it got my attention and focus more on product building is what uh, i realized uh, so so i started uh, in 2015 january i started working on a game called rocket romeo uh, there was a character which was ch chicken look like character uh, but the character was having a propeller at the back uh, falling from the sky just to reach the uh, Juliet um, and there was hurdles all in between and you would tap to propel him upwards so that his speed is not so high that you would hit the hurdle I, it took me 45 days to build that game from scratch and it was so much fun uh, that I just could not think anything else after that. I just thought, okay, okay gaming is something that will truly belong where I truly belong, and that has been uh, my journey towards gaming. Game very started after my experience at Moonfrog. So after building Rocket Romeo, uh, Moonfrog got a Series A funding back then in 2015, uh, and Pushpesh uh, was my college se senior. Uh, he was also from IIT Kharagpur. So uh, he reached out to me, uh, reading one of my blogs. Uh, uh, where I wrote about my process of building that game Rocket Romeo. So he liked it a lot. So he said, Kiar, join us and we'll see what we can build together. So I joined them, uh, spent a good amount of time over there, one and a half, two years. Uh, really great experience. Uh, when I joined them, I really liked that place. So I called Govind as well. Ki, okay, why don't you join as well? Uh, and we'll learn together how to build games and what to what do games do. Uh, and eventually... At the end of 2016, uh, I started seeing this trend uh, where uh, I realized maybe Ludo is a game which people want to play. It was not such a big market that a big company would start away, stay, jump into it. Uh, and it was good enough for us to jump. So so we thought, okay, let's let's move out. Let's start building Ludo. And that's how Gameberry started. So, uh, did you distribute Rocket Romeo? I did, I did. Uh, I launched it on Play Store uh, and promoted it through blogs, but it was difficult uh, to get. So, that was one of the places where I realized that uh, distribution is a problem in gaming for sure. Um, and probably when we started Gameberry, the first thing that we were very clear that we will not spend money on marketing because that's a uh, sink, huge sink. And you will still be in a battle of PNL. Um, so we would go after games which are organically being demanded. So Ludo was organically being demanded by people. And then when a game which was organic in nature, if you build it really, really well, we were sure that we would have a good product market. How do you know Ludo was demanded? Uh, did you have some data? Like did you look at some Google Trends? or Right, right. Google Trends plus similar web was one of the softwares uh, that, that I was using. Okay. So, uh, what were the options for you to distribute? Uh, one is, of course, an Android app. Uh, but uh, what about, like, uh, I believe Zynga did a lot of its distribution through Facebook and all. Were those also options in front of you at that time? Because 
I think today nobody talks of Facebook's uh, games. Uh, Absolutely. Back then also, I think Facebook gaming was pretty much dead. Um, most of the developers were focused on mobile. Mm-hmm. I mean, 17 years. Why did uh, Facebook gaming die? I think mean, mobile experience is a lot more than what a web HTML5 game can do. So the engagement, engagement, retention and engagement is really, really high on mobile. Uh, and the experience is a lot more immersive uh, compared to Facebook. Interesting. Okay. So uh, what did Ludo look like? Absolutely. So we were very clear that we have to give a multiplayer experience. We wanted people to connect with other folks. Have So we were the first game to provide chat, in-game chat very WhatsApp-like chat that you're playing a game and then you are going on a chat window to uh, express yourself, talk to the other person. Uh, we had this option where if, let's say, if you get delayed while typing, uh, so you will not be thrown out of the game. Generally, what games do, they, they'll they give you three turns where you can miss the turn, uh, miss the timer, and then they'll throw you out of the game. So our principle was that when you are playing an online game with somebody, you have all the time in the world. Uh, we will create a timer for you, but then we'll create an experience so that you can play with the other, talk to the other person very easily. You can send some some fast chats to tease the other person again. Uh, and, and the chatting option was phenomenal. It's a super smooth uh, experience. The third, the one interesting thing that we did was while you were chatting and engaged in your chat, you would miss out a turn multiple times, right? So we created this auto mode where the computer takes over if you are busy chatting. So I've seen people keeping the phone aside, doing their daily work, looking at their game, then coming back into the game. And there was no experience like this in in the world. Nobody has done this. And uh, what was the uh, way to monetize it? Did you have monetization from beginning or? Yes, we did. We did. We did. And and I, I think that is one of the key few of the top innovations that we have done. Uh, so ideally, Ludo market, if we look at the current space also, uh, board games monetize 80-20. 80% ads, 20% IAP. IAP is basically your in-app purchases. So user is buying something inside the game uh, for advantage, for anything. So, so we started thinking, okay, how do you monetize people if you're not showing ads? And because nobody has done in the board's game market. Then one day where, while we were developing, uh, we were playing a playing game together. We we both, me and Govin, and we were, one of us got triple six. And, and it felt like, damn, if I had an option of re-rolling it, then I would just get rid of the six. So we thought, why not create it as a, uh, as a feature inside the game, where if the third six is coming, you have an option of re-rolling your dice uh, and that will cost something which is in the game but uh, will allow the user to re-roll it. So it is giving, as a player, it is giving me an advantage that I have an extra roll while playing the game. Uh, but then it was fine. It was very small of a game changer for the whole game. So so Govin came back and said, okay, why only on the third six? Why not every turn? And I said, okay, why not? Like, maybe. <laughs> and then, then we thought, uh, we thought, okay, this sounds good. Uh, if people don't like it, we will remove it from the game. Uh, otherwise, we'll just go ahead with it. Uh, and we launched it. And people, nobody said anything about it. So that is where our learning was that if a lot of time it is on our, in our head that maybe the user will feel this and that and this and that. But maybe this is what they want at times. Uh, because that's what we felt while playing the game. So, so we gave this option where you can re-roll your dice uh, at, and it costs you certain gems, uh, and that gems eventually you have to buy, uh, which is driving the seventy percent of the revenue of the game. And thirty percent comes from where? Thirty percent is there is a uh, stake which is going on, which is the coins in the game. Uh, so when you are playing with me, I we also wanted you to be serious about it, not just quit the game at times when you don't like it. So we wanted to introduce some kind of blocker to people. So you, we both will put 500 coins as, as stake and the winner takes all. Uh, and these coins are just virtual currency. You'll not get back or get anything. It, is, it just keeps on building. So you start with 500, then you move to 2,000, you move to 10,000, then you move to 50,000. And then eventually 10 million, 20 million, something like that. 
so it's a it's a feeling that that you are gambling but then you are playing a serious game that's that risk and reward is what we wanted to attach to it but how did that uh, give you monetization because you said people can't withdraw it and it's not real money it's just uh, fictional coins uh, how did you make money from that so you will eventually sometimes users will run out of those coins because you will lose right you when you run out of it uh, you want to play game the game because you are liking the rest of the experience of it right now uh, and sometimes people even buy 10 million packs because they feel that i don't want to play lower games and why do i don't why why i don't want to play lower bet games is because i want to be matched with a top class player so that is how it differentiates between the level of players as well so it makes the whole gaming experience lot more worthy for you so it is the experience that you're looking for and what you're paying for interesting uh, so everybody would start with like 500 coins and then they would earn uh, and move up and then be able to bet more and the more they are able to bet the better is the quality of opponent that they are meeting because opponent should have already moved up to be able to play like a 10000 coin game okay 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 interest so it automatically separates them out makes them make it makes it interesting for them interesting fact i'll tell you that people even though sometimes they have more coins they would like to play at the lower bet and and why do they do it because they want to get matched with interesting people rather than playing a game with an expert so they are looking for a casual ludo game but they want more variety of players to be matched against most users will have 500 coins so they get a wide spectrum of players in that region and you can uh, choose to play with your friends or it is a random matching absolutely i think there are multiple options you can actually play two player game you can play four player game you can play with your friends you can play with two friends three friends four friends uh, you can team up team up was the first team up built uh, in ludo space by us so you and me will be a team and once you take your tokens inside your dices can help me move my tokens inside as well so that is how a team will perform and you can strategize with your teammate talk to their teammate separately and send him a message uh things like that so it becomes very interesting there are i've seen people pairing up uh, generally couples playing team up because they they are very excited about playing with their husband or their friends or their boyfriend so they like to uh, people who are in relationship they would like to go get on a call and then start a ludo game be talking with each other but play a ludo game on the side so you guys quit your job uh, when you started building ludo yes 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 and uh, how how did it go then like you know uh, when did you launch what kind of numbers did you start seeing when did it uh, become enough to uh, reinvest in the business and grow the business right so we left in 20 20th january 2017 was the last uh, day we were working over there and after that uh, in in a one and a half months span of time we released the first version of it uh, which had just basic two player coming together marketing matched it took us another 2 3 months to develop features like private table uh, the undo mechanics the team up uh, team up systems uh, the basic leaderboard so it, it took us good amount of time 3 to 4 months to come up with all these features together but within 2 months I, we were starting to see 500 downloads 600 downloads every day coming to us uh which like boosted our confidence like heavily because people were organically coming they were liking the game we were talking to them trying to understand what do they want more things like that we were not looking at data interestingly back then and i again feel sometimes it is bliss in disguise because at we were we were so focused on get, giving them the right experience that we were just reading what they are saying and just abiding by what people said in reviews which like the app uh, reviews on play store comments and reviews ha huh? okay yes so this if they said ki this particular experience i don't did not like the next release will get that fixed 100% chance so there was huge loyalty from people because they knew that that they these guys are going to fix it uh, in april i think it was 10th april or 12th april govin was working on some server side uh, 
code and accidentally he deleted the whole database and we lost all our users that day right and it was and it we had around 10 12000 dau the back then um, and all of them started complaining that uh, that i'm not able to see my account my coins are gone my gems are gone what is happening and i was looking at emails and i was thinking ki yaar what has happened so i checked go with govin and going what has happened they said i don't know so he checked this terminal and it says ki okay i have accidentally deleted the whole database but luckily because the people be, people were so loyal to us they they forgot all the what what has happened to them they went back to playing their game logged in again started doing things again and within within 6 months we were viral in pakistan we we were everybody in pakistan was playing ludo star uh, when pakistan was playing so much saudi arabia because there is a huge immigrant from pakistan to saudi arabia so the shopkeepers workers in in shops they were they started playing ludo star uh, the residents of saudi saudi arabia the they started seeing what is happening like everybody is playing this game called ludo star so they started playing ludo star uh, and and we were like that was a typical time that we had in our uh, dau journey uh, revenue wise we are in our peak right now but uh, that was the dau peak that we had back then because that virality was super high which went back uh, to a lower numbers uh, back then in covid again it started growing a faster a picked up again and then settled to a new baseline so that was our curve for ludo parchisi again had a very similar journey uh pretty much the same game what, what was the peak dau at that time when it went viral in saudi we had 6 million dau in in ludo back then and now we have 1.5 million dau so that was that was too high for us back then and but you had enough money for the server costs right right absolutely after 6 months we realized that this is going it's getting out of control for a two person business to be there that is where we started thinking okay how do we bring people kisko bulana hai kahan se lana hai so that that was the time when uh, we had peak traffic and then we started hiring building the team uh, and when we were not sure how we want to build yeah tell me about that like how did you figure out how to build a team first first few people we were very skeptical because we were not sure how to do that uh, we did not have investors to advise in a certain sense so so it was pretty much network hiring that we did we brought in to pradeep pradeep uh, he's heading marketing right now and data from at gameberry He, we brought him in he was our roommate but he was working at hype games so so we asked him to join us uh, and then manish from it kadakpur again uh, he he joined us uh, as a fourth person and then we hired, started hiring five six folks few customer support folks few artists uh, started building with whatever understanding we had we started hiring folks to see where this goes we were very slow at in the first two years we were very slow with hiring because we were not sure who do we want how big do we want to go what do we want to do from this and things like that but we were doing pretty well why why did you take the customer support because we wanted somebody to take care of the emails that was flooding like it, there were so many emails coming so many uh, queries on facebook we wanted them to be there so uh, tell me about part easy that when did you start thinking of second game so interestingly it started with ludo itself because when we were researching on ludo uh, uh, we we found this game called uh, called parcheesi in spain one of the companies had built a spanish company and we again did not like the game we thought ki this is a crap game that is present so this is again the same thing like a traditional game which was made digital absolutely exactly the same exactly the same and it was pretty much ludo but it had two dice and the spots of movement were higher than ludo certain rules were different uh, and we did not knew how to play parcheesi so we went online read public articles where uh, rules of parcheesi were mentioned things like that and we understood okay what do we want from this game and we knew that we would build a good ludo experience so we knew we can build a better parcheesi experience as well but we did not and the third point was that it was the market was spain so we knew that this is a country which will monetize better than indian and uh, pakistani diaspora so then we went back and thought okay we'll create a engine kind of a setup where if you want ludo you can create ludo if you want parcheesi you can create parcheesi uh, 
and everything else will be same. We'll stick to that basics that everything has to be the same and we'll not pay attention what is to create a difference between both the games. So that is how we minimized our efforts uh, and created both these games. Parcheesi took one year to... So you're saying that you created Parcheesi within that same app? Like a person downloading the app could choose which mode he wants to play? Okay. No, 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 no. The person would not know. So as a user, it is Ludo or Parcheesi. But when creating a uh, build or the final upload build, you you have that or you had that option of choosing the, which game build you are creating. Okay. Oh, that's very nice. So that way, any upgrades to one game are automatically getting upgraded in the other game also. Whatever monetization engine you want to tweak, whatever you want to tweak is tweaking is getting tweaked in both games together. Right. And 2017, I look at how much downloads Parcheesi was getting back then. So the download was not that huge. But it was on top 50 charts of Spain. So that is why it was in our attention that it is some doing something and people want it. Uh, interestingly, that category grew pretty big because of us. Uh, because the experience was so good. People who were playing Parcheesi offline, they started playing Parcheesi online. Uh, they invite, started inviting their friends. If you go to our Instagram page, you'll see 1.3 million subscriber followers who are there. Uh, they will keep sharing their stories, birthday stories where they have cake of Parcheesi star. Uh, we are a big fan of it. So, and it grew from Spain to Morocco because Morocco, North Morocco is heavily influenced by Spain. Uh, so it started growing in Morocco. It's People in Brazil started playing Parcheesi. People in uh, Panama, Venezuela, Dominant Republic, Colombia. And right now, Colombia is the biggest market in terms of DAU for Parcheesi. Okay, okay. And uh, when did you launch Parcheesi? Parcheesi was... So it was so easy for us that it was just a week's delay between both the releases. So anything that we are building for Ludo, the release will come out for Parcheesi within a week's time. That was the approach. And then by the end of that year, it started growing very heavily in Spain. So it took longer than Ludo, but even it, that game has grown. And right now it has like 2.5 million daily active users. Wow. So right now it's bigger than Ludo. Yeah. Amazing. Okay. And uh, uh, did it start monetizing also in the year one? Uh, Parcheesi? Or... Same, same. It, it, it did exactly what we anticipated. And because it was Spain, so the monetization was a lot more better but interestingly ludo had saudi arabia and mina market so yeah. that was also doing pretty well for us how much revenue did you do in year one then it's around 10 11 million is what we did in the first year uh, rupees or dollars dollars wow incredible 10 million dollars in year one is amazing okay there would be a play store cut in it or this is after the play store tax? No, no, this this, this is like the total revenue I'm talking about. Uh, there will be a good 35% cut that play store will take, things like that. So that will be was there. But we were not doing marketing back then, not much employee cost. So it was all profit to us. Oh, amazing, amazing. Okay. So uh, tell me the journey from this. Like the, you have had a pretty strong year one. Uh, what, what was on your mind then by the time you were entering year two? By the time year two, that whole buzz had already gone <laughs> because um, uh, the virality stays for a certain time and then it decays. But then you would not see that steep curve that was week on week we were seeing back in 2017. So instead of focusing on Ludo and Parcheesi more and building team around that, we thought, okay, okay this game, these games are doing good. Let us build another game. So we started building a game called Monopoly. Uh, bankrupt uh, and it was monopoly created into a digital form again six eight months we were building that game itself and then Ludon and Parcheesi we were doing slight bit of changes fixing things here and there and we did not know what to do from here onwards so but that whole journey of building bankrupt and looking into data it unlocked a lot of things for us it started giving us that product insight that marketing insight how to grow things so we started applying those things in Ludo, looking back at data and making changes to it. And we realized that, okay, now these two games are not just saturating. The degrowth is not in such a way that it will go back to a very bad number. It has saturated to a good number. So that means that uh, people are not going to leave it. In 2018 end, we were very clear 
that we want to build a big team for Ludo purchasing. We started hiring first PMs were hired in 2019, January. Uh, started looking into data analyst, lot more artists, UX designers, game designers. So that, that's where we started our focus and very quickly moved to a size of around 30, 40 people in 2019. What about bankrupt? Bankrupt, we closed it because there were retention problems compared to what we were seeing in Ludo Party. Retention, especially D30 retention. Uh, Monopoly was a very long game. So we created a version where uh, where you could complete your business game in just 30-40 minutes. So it was a lot more game design inclined towards converging very quickly, which was not real property trading experience that people get on board games. And it had good D7, D31 retention, but not great D30 retention. D7 is like people who continue to play after 7 days. D30 is people who continue to play after 30 days. Right. After installing the app, uh, these are the retention numbers that we look at. Okay. So people were trying it for novelty, but they were not sticking around. So we closed that game. Uh, team size went around 35. So we had a great 2019 compared to 2000, 2018. 2017 was the best. Uh, we had dip from there onwards, 2018-19. Like the revenue also dip because users would have come down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So 2019, we were doing better than 2018 because now we know knew okay, how to move the revenue levers, how to move the engagement levers. We understood how to do that. Can you also help uh, outsiders understand how to improve revenue levers in a game? W what are the ways in which you do that? So, I mean, the best way to understand or help your revenue, increase your revenue is either you will get new user, new payers in your game or you will increase the payment that people, payers are doing right now. If you have not unlocked the potential amount of money that a payer can give, that means there is a huge scope of doing it. So it's better to uh, focus on them rather than focusing on converting people to payers. So that very simple to metrics that you have to look at. So you're saying that you were leaving money on the table. The people who were paying, people who would have paid more also, uh, but you were not clear on that. And so the analytics, uh, so how did you figure out that they will pay more? Like by running experiments, by increasing the price for these things? or like Very, very small experiments. Uh, um, very simple, simple experiments. So let's say, uh, just looking at the funnel, if let's say a person is moving from a lower bed to higher bed, uh, Ideally, you would think, okay, uh, so our revenue was coming from gems because of selling gems, which was the undo mechanics. So ideally, you would think people would do equal amount of undo at equal all the levels. Uh, but if you go deeper into it, there is a pattern to it. People will not do so much undo at lower bet, lower stake amounts. They would do more at a higher stake amount. So if if you look at just this, and if you... So uh, the first time when we built it, uh, the pricing of these undo was flat across bets. And we thought, okay, why do you think about so many things, right? Keep it simple, same price point everywhere. So we were just taking 20, 30 gems in a game. Now, when we looked into it, we saw that most people are doing undo at a higher bet. And if you think from a product angle, ideally, you should charge more because a lot more is at stake. Right, and that is why they are doing that. Got it, got it. Okay. So, uh, 2019, how much revenue did you end with? Like, you did 10 million in 17, then? Right. No, no, I, I actually was checking back the number. Uh, 10 million is what we did in 2018. Uh, 2017, calendar year I'm talking about, we did around 6, 6.6 6 million. And 2019, we did around 7.5 million. So, so that was not that great, but... Uh, but it was actually getting better on month-on-month -month revenue basis. So that is why I remember that 2019 was good for us. 2020 was fantastic for us because of COVID. When we entered March, before March, Parcheesi was played around 1.2 million daily active users. End of April, it was played around by 9 to 10 million daily active users. Wow, okay. Because people are isolated and it's a way to connect uh... Right, okay. And interestingly, our games were serving that need of connecting with other folks. So it was go-to for people. And because it's so mass, mass game and casual that there are a lot of people incoming to us. So I have seen 
numbers improving for other games as well, but this was too big of an increase. Uh, so both these games, Parchi Ludo went back to 5 million daily active users, Parchi Z went to 10 million daily active users. Uh, run, deploying server were a nightmare at that, that time because every night you would know that you need 3-4 new servers to be deployed today, tonight. So that was exciting times for us. Uh, 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 okay, okay. So uh, you continued with that team of 30 people by the time you were entering COVID. Right, right, right. But then when COVID hit, the DAU increased so high, uh, we knew that now we have to unlock it even further because the reach is a lot more, a lot more people playing. And, and our learning was telling every time when you add more smart folks, you will unlock new things that you have not thought about. Um, so I'm like I'm grateful to the smartness of people and in Gameberry that they have unlocked a lot more things than what we could have done ourselves. So in 2020, we decided, okay, let's double the size of people, keep building more. So we went from 60 to 100 to 155 right now, uh, and and that most of that in most of the people have come in COVID, post COVID uh, era for us. So uh, how do you? Uh, find gaming talent. Do you look at hiring from other game companies? Uh, I mean, is there ready-made talent or do you need to create talent? Very difficult. Dan. We have to create, we had created talent uh, and we have spent a lot of time with our team members, yeah. allowing them to make mistakes. It has taken a lot of time for us to build this team. And I'm really proud of the team that we have built so far. Very smart folks, uh, like people who come back and tell me that I have made mistake on my design time that I've done with Lodo and Parcheesi and they are right about it. They have pointed out such nitty gritties which I ne never thought about uh, and it, it just fills my day that okay this is too much fun that even after six years of building this game I still don't understand the user so much. Better. So, What do you hire for? How, what do you look at when you're hiring? It's a mix of things especially if I am looking at product managers. I'm looking at uh, two things. I mean obviously they have they have, should be smart. The other thing that I want to see is that they have certain intent towards building games, uh, which which makes it a lot more easier for them to enjoy the whole process uh, of being here. So in your interview, you, you you talk a lot about what kind of games you like to play and like you go deep into. Right. The assignments are also sometimes inclined towards making you play certain games and then checking back, okay, what you have learned from that game, and things like that. Interesting. And you hire people who are uh, what, like engineer MBA combos or like who have done coding and or what, like what is the profile? You Pretty much based on the role, we prefer a little bit of an MBA experience as well because that helps a lot in understanding it faster. But we have folks which have, who have not done MBA as well and they are doing equally good. So, so no, not necessarily true. Okay, okay. So you're at uh, 150 now. Uh, and w what revenue are you at now? Last, this particular year, uh, 2022, we have done around 39.5 million in total revenue. Okay, amazing. You're almost at the 50 million mark. And with just these two games, Ludo and Parcheesi. Right. These two games have now been split into three pods. One specifically focusing into Ludo, one focusing on Parcheesi. One focusing on a new product inside these two games. Uh, what is that new product? So, what we have seen, people in Ludo and Parchi, they have an affinity towards talking to other folks a lot, and which is because it's a social game. So they 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 are not just looking for game per se, but they want to spend their time talking to someone. And voice chat is the best way for these folks to do that. Now, if you look at certain uh, economies. Some we had, especially China, voice chat based products have come out over there, which monetizes in itself altogether really well, where people talk to other folks and gift, uh, gift each other certain things in the game just to slight bit of shows, make them feel good about it, which monetizes well. Uh, so if you look at TikTok also, they have this reward system where uh, you can reward your c content creator. Yeah, yeah, reward the creator. Huh, right, right. Right. So even in these voice channels where 10 people are sitting together, somebody, a VIP would come in and, and would like to uh, reward people who are saying something great, something interesting. Uh, and reward is basically something like a collection 
for them. Person who's getting that reward has a um, appreciation form where they can look back and see how many gifts they have gotten in the game and what is their reputation in terms their club's reputation, things like that. So that is a new product that we're building in these games. Uh, and it's very entirely with a very different mindset uh, where we want to make people to engage with them and each other and talk to each other. Uh, so it, that is why I separated it out a bit. So these three pods now is what Ludo Parthesi is all about. And it's all together 110 people almost. Okay, I'm not able to relate with paying another player unless I'm dating or I'm looking to date. <laughs> That's a very interesting point. Uh, ideally, you would think that, but in the geographies that they play, so especially if I look at this product is very, very popular as a mechanism in Saudi Arabia, MENA region especially. Why, do that, why does that happen? Is because of the restriction in the culture that is present over there. So they generally want to talk to folks uh, and show off that they are VIPs. So these are two terms which are really important to them. They, they want that importance when they come in. And as a pair, when you get that gratification, so let's say I give you a gift which is worth $100. And I've seen people gifting uh, the other folks $100 worth gift. And this gift would be like the gems uh, or coins? Or... This, this gift would be just an image or a animation playing for that other person for a brief amount of time. So, so people like to tell everybody that, hey, I am here and I liked what you said or what you did. Uh, and it is not necessarily one-on-one. -on -one. It is to a group sometimes. I've seen all the 10 folks are saying something very interesting. So the person would give to all the 10 people. And I've seen people doing mimicry, doing singing songs, just to entertain their audience. And they spend hours and hours, seven hours, eight hours in a group chat where they are just talking that they are cooking something at home. Uh, and and they are by the time, so that to cooking and on the side they're chatting or in the club itself, you can play Ludo as well. So, so there's a whole mix of things that is happening for you as an entertainment inside that. So, and the person who is receiving the gift, uh, can they convert that into cash? No, they can't. And But they can convert, they get a portion of that gift in the form of that currency. Let's say I have gifted you uh, a gift called an island. I have gifted you a car, let's say. And the car costs me 500 hearts. Uh, so you'll get 100 hearts as a conversion. So you are... You're getting hearts. And what? how does it help you is because then you can send gifts from your side in future. So that is how it translates between people. So you are exchanging currencies in a way. And you, uh, have you already piloted this uh, voice chat and gifting? Yeah, yeah, we have done that. We have done that. Okay, okay. So how much revenue does it make like compared to the other methods? Right now, it is, right now for us, it is doing very minuscule, uh, around $1,500 a day, something like that. Uh, but then we won't, we know that this will go bigger from here. Okay. You think it will be bigger than the other methods because it's more intimate, more... Uh... It could. It could. Highly. Interesting. I used to think that uh, a game studio is a bit like, say, a movie studio where you need to constantly create hits. Uh, with in, in your case, you've decided not to focus too much on creating more hits and just milk the existing hits better. Uh, so, you know, what is your take on that? Do you think that you will also need to create more hits or, uh, you know, help me understand that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I said Ludo Purchase team is around 110. Then rest of the 40 people are actually on new games. Uh, uh, one of the game is called Baggaman. Again, a Turkish uh, Middle Eastern uh, dice-based board game, which we are trying to build. And again, it's it's, this game is showing really good retention at par with what Luden Parcheesi is showing. Then we have, uh, again, a, a very special team that we have built. This team has made a game called Traitor Labs, uh, which was built when Among Us was famous. Uh, post that, we thought uh, this category is going to open up. So why not create a different kind of experience in the social deduction space? I am not familiar with Among Us. So, what is this space? What 
So, so Among Us was very viral during COVID times. Uh, it is if you have played Mafia uh, with a group of people. No, I haven't played that. Of no. Okay, uh, so Mafia is a very popular game where there is one killer. There will be a group of people, ten people playing together, uh, and it's playing physically like you play in parties. It's a party game. So there will be a killer who will silently kill people every night. And the group group will come go back and into a discussion to figure out who could be a potential killer, and they will eliminate people one by one. And the final winner, if it's a killer, then the killer community wins. If it's a citizen, uh, then the citizen wins. What Among Us did was made it digitalize it really really well. So you can see that there are you are moving in a lab or a spaceship. Uh, where you are doing certain things, and there is an imposter who is killing everybody, and then you are group doing a group discussion. Who could be that imposter? So, because it was so suitable for COVID, it was immensely popular. It had like hundred million downloads in a month time. So, when Among Us got popular, we we thought there are a lot of small gaps because you had to get on a call, meet call to do all these things. Okay, okay, okay. The voice chat was not in. Right, right, and then we knew how to build voice chat. So we were very fast on it. Okay, we'll bring voice chat to it and create a different kind of experience. So we brought brought in a zombie mode in it, where there was a zombie. He was running around, making you zombie. So you had to save and complete the task before the zombie eats you. So that was one game that we built, and it was really good in terms of what we have executed, but difficult in terms of growing it. So. A one year time we took with that game. We built that game, uh, closed it in April 2021. Uh, then started a game called Merge. Uh, quickly realized that that space was uh, very crowded, very expensive to grow. What is that space with Merge? So in in Merge games, you typically have a similar looking objects that you will merge together to create a higher level object. And then there are uh, things that you are doing with those objects. Uh, so very simple mechanic, but people like it a lot because you inherently you like to see patterns on a screen. So that game feeds to that uh, psychology of yeah. I, I think ads of these type of games like the, you have an army of one color, and uh, if your army is bigger than the other, then they convert to your color. And, uh, okay, right, exactly that. So, so we built Traitor, then Merge, then a uh, couple of failures along the way. Why did you shut down Merge? Like- Merge was very expensive. Like the the market was, there were a lot of big players coming into the space. Uh, uh, getting an install from tier one countries was very expensive, and it was we were we knew that it is not going to grow organically. Then after that, this team, this new games team, is working on a game called World League, uh, which is our PvP word game, one versus one word game, real time, and it has it is in a good stage right now, but not really. It's a stage where I can say it's a success or a failure. And then there is a game that we have released recently called Match Star 3D. Uh, very simple. You have to pick object from a bundle of lot of objects, and in a specific amount of time. So pretty fun. I mean, if if somebody wants to check out, they can check out our Match 3D Star. And this is also a social game or is solo? No, no, it's it's a solo game. So this team is specifically looking at games which uh, not necessarily is social type that that we have at the other space. And these uh, experiments uh, were they monetizing through in-app purchase or through uh, like advertising? Primarily, we look after in-app purchases. It still we have the same philosophy mostly uh, that at first we will think in-app first. We would like to monetize through uh, in our purchases, and if there is a scenario where it's not happening and and ads could be a solution to it, then we would do that. So uh, it seems like you've changed your uh, approach towards marketing. Where yeah, initially you said you didn't want to spend money, but it seems like you're now okay to spend money also for acquisition. So what drove that change? Uh, frankly, the reality is that now the biggest challenge for gaming industry is distribution. Uh, so you cannot be a studio without a marketing capability, and you cannot reach hundred, hundred twenty million, hundred fifty million mark if you are not good at marketing. Uh, so to scale from here, you have to do it, and you should understand to do it how to do it better and better than everybody else, obviously. So 
So that is why we have moved from a studio which did not believe in marketing to a studio which now spends a lot of money in marketing as well and want to get better at it. Okay, okay, okay. And uh, so, uh, what are the ways in which you do marketing? What works? What does it work? Uh, what are the kind of return on ad spends that you see? Uh, what is your average customer acquisition cost? Right. I will start with probably how you can divide marketing probably. Uh, so, the biggest piece is performance marketing in gaming. Uh, and when you say performance marketing, it means very data-oriented marketing where you know that you are spending a particular amount of time, money, and then that money will eventually get recouped over the period of time. Uh, so you have to get very good at measuring that, understanding and predicting what will be the LTV curve of a user. LTV curve is basically lifetime value of the user. So if you look at a typical player of Ludo or Parchesi, the player will stay for a really long time. And if you see the purchase pattern of that player, uh, you will see that till 18 months, the payer is actually paying in the game and it keeps growing. After 18 months, this there is a decline in interest and that hits a saturation. Uh, so that means if you plan a bit around 12 months window, uh, then you can spend money and recoup it over the period of time. And you are pretty much on the positive side of things with a good margin, of course. And this, sometimes we include ad revenue in it. Sometimes we don't include the ad revenue as well. So that that's how we approach it. We look at the LTV curve. We look at, okay, what is the amount of uh, ROAS should get met at 30 days, 60 days interval. If they are meeting it, then the campaigns are working well. If they are not meeting it, that should kill the campaign a lot earlier. Things like that. This these All these things come into performance marketing. Then organic marketing is basically your... Uh, ASO side of things where you are playing around with screenshots. One, one quick question on performance. Uh, so you are looking at the uh, LTV curve. You would also need to see the conversion of uh, gamers into paying gamers, right? Like the non-paying gamers. No, but when we prepare this LTV curve, it is our typical DAU LTV curve. Okay, okay, okay. So it's averaging out that out of 100, uh, 50 are paying, but it's averaging it out and okay, got it. So, and you look at the campaign level. So, if 100 people have installed, what has happened to those 100 people on an average? So, that simplifies the whole equation for us. And what platforms do you use uh, for performance marketing? Google, Unity, Facebook, uh, TikTok, Snap. We, we try all these platforms to see where we can get better returns, things like that. W what is Unity? I have not heard of Unity. So, most of the games in the world are actually built on a engine called Unity uh, and because they have built an engine, they have a very simple integration of ads in them. So they are also potentially a good network for gamer games to acquire users because of that. Mm, okay, so Unity is essentially a Google AdWords for advertising within games. Right. Got it. Yeah, so that was the performance marketing piece. Uh, organic side, we, we uh, divided into ASO where you want to optimize your play store listing, yeah, play around with languages, multiple languages, what do they want to search and things like that. Uh, you will see different logo, different screenshots in different countries. Uh, and there are a number of things that you can play, keep playing around with and which helps it slowly to, to get additional 10% traffic. And that's your organic side of things. Uh, then you can do more influencer-based marketing where you are probably reaching out to gamers through gamers, uh, which also pretty much helps a lot of time. Like Twitch is a live streaming platform for gamers. So you would have people playing this game, like a popular gamer who plays this on his Twitch account is in a way then going to drive downloads. Exactly. So that's, that's how we bucket it broadly. Is it only on Android that you're focusing or you also have iOS apps and what is the split? There? We have, we have. Actually, 50% of the revenue is coming from iOS. For us, yeah, because the paying propensity is higher for Apple users. Okay, uh, tell me about uh, how gaming uh, monetization happens. Right. So, if you look at the whole landscape of gaming, uh, there will be multi very similar-looking tactics or mechanisms uh, that can be grouped into monetization methods. Uh, the first one I would say is where you want to speed up the content or get a blowed content. So take example of Candy Crush. So you are trying to cross a level 
you are almost on the verge of crossing it, but you don't have enough moves. So now this is, you'd want to cross that level. You are trying to speed up that content. So you would like to get extra moves and you would like to pay for it. And people like that because some levels are very difficult in nature. So sometimes only occasionally you will land up to a level where you are very close to close, come, coming close to it. So you would like to pay for it because you don't want to replay that level again. Then you will see some games like Clash of Clans or um, Heyday for that matter where uh, you are growing a crop. But the crop takes an hour to grow. Uh, but you can pay for it just to speed it up. Uh, now, why these monetization models work really well? And these are the top type of model monetization model because they are not competing against anybody else. You are competing against yourself and they sync very fast. Sync very fast means you, for an hour, once you have used it, you are seeing a very huge gratification that my one hour has gotten reduced to a zero second. And your currency has just got and gone out in an instant. Uh, it's not a slow process. So this is the first category where you speed up content and get access to more content very fast. Second is a leverage category where you are up with somebody else and you want an advantage over the other player. Very simple example could be Ludo. Part, Ludo because an extra dice roll is a slight advantage to the other player. And when there is an advantage like this, you are doing this because you want to be the winner. So again, it's a sync, but it's a slow sync in Ludo because, because it will take 40 minutes to close a game. You will buy certain gems, but it will slowly get decayed from your wallet. So it will not monetize so great. Uh, but it's a fair bit of monetization that happens. Then the third is cosmetic, which is skin. You would like to buy avatars. You would like to buy dices in our games for that matter. So... We have very interesting concepts of dice sales. So you would like to buy those skins. In a shooter game, you would like to buy a gun which is looking uh, very fascinating and you want to show off to other players who are watching you. Things like that. So uh, so I think these are the top three monetization models that work. Other than that, ad monetization is always there. But this is primarily IAP-based monetization that works really well. Okay, so you've not done anything on the speed up side or, or there's uh, match 3d is uh, uh, using that match 3d is on the speed up content side where you will have a lot of levels in it you will cross those levels things like that yes mm -hmm. so the third type you spoke about of uh, skins of cars this is when this whole nft gaming space is in like now there are gaming companies which are saying that if you buy a skin it's an nft for you which you can then sell and you can make some trading profit on it and things like that exactly so this is a category you're not exploring so far. Is it on the roadmap to like this? Not right now. Uh, pretty much focused towards load of purchase and the social board game side and trying to figure out new new games. Uh, I mean, maybe two years down the line, three years down the line, may, maybe we can explore. Okay, interesting. And uh, help you understand the gaming industry. Like, you know, what are the kind of players in it? Uh... So broadly, if you look at gaming industry, you will see PC console games, which are very, very hardcore uh, shooters and more detail oriented, more graphically AAA uh, with the depth in it and like, narrative in it. And th those are the PC console games. Then comes mobile. So this like uh, Epic Games uh, would be this PC console game maker which Microsoft is uh, trying to acquire. Look at Fortnite, like the depth of immersion is very, very high. So that's the hardcore games. Then comes mobile, which is let slightly casual on the sides, uh, where the immersion is not so deep as casual. Uh, and in mobile, you can divide it into free-to-play gaming and then real money gaming. And a lot of time, people especially confuse real money gaming with gaming. But internally, if you ask a free-to-play game gaming company, they will say that's not really a gaming company. Uh, they are building an ecosystem around games. They are not building games as such. Uh, so free to play gaming is what we do and in India there are companies like Moonfrog, Play Simple, uh, uh, GSN Games which have been acquired by Scopely now, uh, Zynga, these, these are the top players along with us uh, in free to play space. Hmm, hmm, okay, uh, why, why is uh, real money gaming uh, 
getting so much funding like these real money gaming companies are becoming unicorns and so on yeah we are in terms of money there is uh, there is definitely a lot of opportunity to make revenue from from the real money space uh, if you look at ludo space also if it gets legalized in terms of uh, betting probably it will also have a very good uh, billion dollar market for sure um, uh, so rummy has been a a very huge market in real money um, and it has proved again and again that it's a very healthy business as such in terms of business metrics so and a very predictable business so in if you look at free to play problem is predictability where you, it's a creative process as a vc you cannot predict that this will be a successful team or not but in real money you can still predict okay if the team looks smart the space is visible you can make a mark over there okay oh, oh, you said that betting is allowed in ludo so is there a regulation that betting is not allowed in some games betting is only allowed in games which are game of skill not a game of chance and ludo falls in a gray area where it has skill attached to it as well as chances are attached to it so according to indian law it is not very clear whether it's a game of skill or complete game of chance it's somewhere in between and yet that is why you are Rummy has the same gray area, no? No, Rummy is pretty much defined and proven that it's a game of skill. And I think cricket is the other space which companies are using for real money gaming. Right, right. Yes. Again, that is the fantasy side of things where again they have the uh, the skill side of thing has been explored over it. Mm. But uh, I guess real money games are not uh, allowed on Play Store, right? Like uh, you can't list them. On- recently play store have started uh, experimenting with real money games as well if you look at uh, dream 11 is now on the top 3 4 downloads downloaded games in play store so they are doing an experiment i think either it's an experiment or it is completely out there that i'm not very updated with uh uh-huh. okay okay what do you see as uh, your future now uh, i think you know like like movie studios uh, eventually that consolidation happens you either acquire or you get acquired uh, and because there is so much value of that finding that hit and so either you find hits and then someone acquires you because you found a hit or you have money enough to acquire companies which have found a hit and then scale it up uh, what do you think is right so i i don't think we are in in the stage right now where we can acquire studios uh but we are not also not looking out for an exit right now uh we are pretty happy with what we have built so far want to do it more want to build more games and there are ways like what we are doing with backgammon we feel we can crack certain formulas where we can predict whether a game will be successful or not and and that is where we are striving as a studio to become that okay can we create a system an ecosystem a understanding which can become an advantage to a studio to to jump into a category and say ki nahi boss hum log jab banayenge to hamara to hit hoga hi hoga the fun is in acquiring studio and when we will do that that is the real achievement that we will do um and and that is that is what uh, in the long run is what we aspire to to do and that brings us to the end of this conversation i want to ask you for a favor now Did you like listening to the show? I'd love to hear your feedback about it. Do you have your own startup ideas? I'd love to hear them. Do you have questions for any of the guests that you heard about in the show? I'd love to get your questions and pass them on to the guests. Write to me at ad at the podium dot in. That's ad at t h e p o d i u m dot in. 